Kaplan is our buddies. <laughs> That's well, the UCLA together, so there's this really strong network, as you guys yeah. recognize among yourselves now, and something that yeah. um, that I had said the first week when Ann Chin was here, and what Sean said with John Lambrinos last week is these people in the audience with you, these will become lifelong friends for you. And if you continue to graduate school, mm -hmm. you just realize you have that incredible yes. support base, and it goes with you. Um, as we work together, that we're all connected, and it's a really, really nice community of people that we share, and, and um, it's it's just really delightful to be working with everybody. So, um, as Dr. Ye mentioned, Hang Chen said that we met each other in 2001. She is the chair of Geosciences and Environment, which at one time was Geography and Urban Planning and Geology. Now the two departments have come together, so she's chair of the department. She's also director of the NASA Direct STEM, um, which is Data Intensive Research and Education Center for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. I assume that's what you were putting up there? Yes, at that that's where the money from. No? <laughs> <laughs> Kelsey LA is very poor, but we are rich. And very culturally diverse. Are we, are we still the most culturally diverse campus in the United States? I, I think so, uh -huh. yeah. Which, which was really a pleasure to work there mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. for that reason, too. Uh, she got her PhD in climatology from the Department of Geography, University of Delaware from Port Wilmot. Taught at Emporia State University and the University of Idaho before she came to Cal State LA in 2001. She has been collaborating with scientists, scientists from the Atmospheric Infrared Sounder Science Team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to understand changing hydrologic cycles under climate, under warming climate since 2004. So we'll have a lot to talk about today. It's a long it's been time. 10 years. Yeah. Her most recent research has focused mm -hmm. on changes in precipitation characteristics under, uh oh, under a and the warming and climate. Cut off here, but this yeah. is the most important. I finish part. you. Oh man. You gotta finish? The administration got to that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that text. That's where it went. But I do want to say, okay. Um, und to understand changing hydrologic cycles under a warming climate um, and moistening atmospheric environment. She's published, this is, she's published over 50 peer-reviewed publications in high-impact journals, including Science Advances, and has been awarded over <coughs> $5.8 million in grants from NASA, MSF, and, and NOAA as well. So thank you. We welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's my first time visit campus. When I drove through the agriculture road, I saw my GPS play game with me, <laughs> <laughs> to get me into somewhere. <laughs> but it was so surreal feeling, you know, coming from the noisy and the urban environment with congested traffic. All of a sudden, I can drive as fast as I can and look at speed limit, 25 miles, people, <laughs> 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 miles, faster than me. It's like, it's a cop? No. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And I went to police station to, to get the parking permit. Nobody there. So I said, I can just park anywhere. <laughs> I'm off the work, right? <laughs> but anyway, so um, Linda said, you guys uh, need some education in the climate change. Yes. And uh, I have been uh, studying climate change since my PhD. Uh, and uh, the research I'm most familiar with, because climate change is such a big issue, it's huge, right? You can only like, like learn a little bit. Your contribution is like a, a, a drop of sand for the whole building. It's like the whole knowledge is so, so vast. So my contribution is to look at the precipitation. How is the precipitation change and the warming climate? So maybe before I'm going to show you my stuff, I'll ask you, what is the precipitation? It's where the water goes in the atmosphere. So it has a cycle that it falls, like a river or whatever. That's the atmosphere, the river? Yeah, yeah in the air. Happens, uh, depending on whatever triggers it to dump it dumps at different exactly. places so it creates droughts yeah. and also mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, floods. Very good. You read a lot. You read <laughs> a lot. But if you take my class, you will be just one sentence. Explain <laughs> all. You have to you know, have a in there? <laughs> 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 so do you heard about the, about precipitation change in the under warming climate? Do you know anything about worry about precipitation change? If people talk about uh, global warming? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, you don't care? I like sunny days. Who cares about <laughs> water? <laughs> the water were coming from nowhere. And then, yes. There's that issue with like warmer storms, so it's like melting snow sooner. Yes, and you you do is go skiing, right? <laughs> yeah. You worry about the snow will melt earlier and causing flooding. Anything else besides snow? Yes. Uh, droughts affecting agriculture. Exactly, yeah, droughts. Is, is this one the most important for California? Because we shouldn't be here. <laughs> the water resources, the precipitation coming down cannot feed us, cannot support our population. In the early days, LA River is the one sustained probably a few thousand people, and then the people move in, what are they gonna do? They dry up the river, they no longer have water. How people live that by back to them? The wagon deliver water to every door. And then each family get a tank of water. What are they gonna do? Husband take a bath first, and the children <laughs> take a bath, and then the wife, poor wife, take the last <laughs> bath, and then the water is gonna scrub the floor. That's how, how you're gonna live without water, right? But anyway, so the presentation, I'm gonna understand a little bit, so we'll be uh, more aware of what we, we need to do. Climate change is happening, and it comes we cannot stop them, especially under current administrations. <laughs> <laughs> so the precipitation basically is a very simple uh, uh, concept. Any kind of water particles can be solid, can be liquid, that fall to the floor, to the ground. So we talk about atmosphere rivers, stuff, those in the air, the clouds, stuff, there are lots of water. If not coming down, we cannot like come to get them, right? It's not part of the precipitation. Precipitation are the one who really supply anything on the, on the ground. So the precipitation has many, many different forms. In the early days, the weather observers, they will go out uh, probably like six, at least six uh, times, uh, eight, eight to six times a day. At the fixed hours, they will record it's drizzle or it's rain. Everybody knows drizzle. It's like sprinkling. You just go out without need any umbrella, and uh, there's no measurement because it kind of evaporates. You know, they don't they don't have accumulation. Rain is a, is a liquid form. Shower is unpredictable. You have sunshine this side, the other side is raining. Shower is oh, something the rain dump here. Sunshine on the shower is different. And the snow, everybody knows snow. It's a freak, uh, like uh, ice crystals. They kind of stick together with a lot of air, fluffy. And we have snow pallet, like a pack, uh, your packing pallet, soft. And we have snow grains, <coughs> like ice or, or rice grain. You want to talk about grain, like hard ice crystals. And then ice crystals, they have different forms. These are very, very cold condition. Snow pallet and hail. In California, we don't see a lot of those solid form <laughs> station, right? <laughs> you know, uh, when we talk about Eskimo language, the, the, the snow alone, the different type of snow, they have, the probably their language only probably about like a few hundred words, but half of these <coughs> words about snow conditions because they directly relate to their life, the husband go out, hunt. They have different kind of surface conditions, so they're gonna do that. So the same thing, in the Siberia, you know, they have a lot of different kind of solid form presentation, so they have all different kind of name for that. But in California, we only have snow or rain. <laughs> <laughs> now, the presentation is coming from clouds. Everybody knows that. You cannot just come in from sky without clouds. So the clouds have, have two major different categories. And the one kind of ca category we call the cumulus form clouds. Have you taken uh, the physical geography or meteorology class here, student? We don't have it. Okay, so I'm going to give you a lesson. The, the cumulus and the clouds are like a puffy clouds. Between clouds, you see uh, clear <coughs> skies. And uh, those puffy clouds normally associate with kind of convective activity. Warm air rises, cold air subside. In subsides area, it's clear and the rises is, is cloudy. And in general, it should be okay if the cloud doesn't get too heavy. But sometimes it gets too heavy, it gets dark and then they start to rain. So that's called the cumulus. So <coughs> associated with the rain, uh, the convective type, which means a more uh, dramatic and a, sh a short term, short time scale, and a short, actually, spatial scales. Cumulus, cumulus, nimbus, 
These are associated with convective precipitation. Those are precipitation for showers. And they uh, sometimes have lightning and thunder and hails, and sometimes associated with tornadoes. In the hurricane clouds, a type of cumulus clouds. If you see the hurricane picture, in the, in the disk in the middle is clear sky, surrounding also clear sky is cumulus form of cloud, very violent. Actually, hur hurricane, they organize in a way, they have walls, air bubbled up and a lot of moisture. The other type of uh, clouds produce precipitation more like steady, predictable, but lasts very long, going on, 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 but small amount and not dramatic. Those associated with the stratosphere cloud. Stratus means a layer, right? Layer cloud, we have all the stratus in the high up in the sky. You can see a little bit of sun behind, we block them. And then we have more closer to surface, very, very dark days. If we don't see the sun at all, we have these uh, nimble stratus. Nimble stratus, stratocumulus, is we call non convective precipitation. Sometimes we call them stratus uh, form precipitation. So the reason I, I bring this out is my most recent paper is to look at two different precipitations, separate them out to see how they change under warming climate. Because we can look at and more details, uh, change of precipitation we call characteristics. Now characteristics include lots and lots of stuff. If you describe a person, what's your characteristics, right? You can have thousands of words to say. If you like a precipitation, you have lots of lots of, and some of these probably have not been invented. Maybe one of you guys can find out another characteristic that can describe the precipitation. <coughs> so the characters, based on different form, you can talk about liquid, solid, or mixed. As one of the students mentioned, the snow melted earlier, and the sometimes supposed to be snow become rain, right? So change these different forms, precipitation, that caused a lot of problem because we know where the water come from in California. Do you know where the water come from? <coughs> Snow melt far away, right? And uh, we have very small amounts we can dig out from aquifers, but mostly we steal water from north and from Colorado River. You know, we, we did the barbarian thing in the early <laughs> days. Uh, we just go steal water and uh, support our nice climate. Uh, the different type of precipitation can be convective and non-convective. Now, when we do research, we need to describe it. What kind of thing we're going to look at? Most common ones, precipitation total, right? Total. How many inches of rain we have every year, right? How many millimeter of precipitation? So that's the total. But total don't tell you much, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, people, if if people never been to California, didn't study geography, they they thought, oh, this amount of inch of rain may not be that bad, but didn't realize it only happened in the winter. In the summer, we don't get any drop. We could move all the rain to the summer, then we don't have to worry about too much. We don't have to do <laughs> irrigation, right? In the winter, we enjoy the beautiful day, and the summer, natural irrigation, we don't have the water. Oh, God. So pristine total is not the only variable. People start looking at the frequency, means how many days are wet. We call wet day. How many days have precipitation? And then people look at intensity. When it rains, rain cat and dogs. People heard about cat and dogs, means it's just <laughs> pouring on you. So intensity is, is important because in the tropical, you guys go to New Orleans, right? When it rains, bam, huge amount, right? You get all soaked wet. If you go to Seattle, when it rains, you don't feel like you need an umbrella. It's always steady, small kind of rain. So intensity is different. Uh, intensity is really related to the climate, the warmer climate, the high intensity. And why is that? If, if I tell you, hey, you know, as climate gets warmer, we're going to have much higher precipitation intensity. Why? I'll ask you why. You have learned nothing but just by your thinking. Why? You think, what can explain as climate gets warmer, we have higher intensity? Be creative thinking. I need to find someone. <laughs> yes. There's more energy being moved around. Exactly. More energy. What type of energy? Thermal energy. Yeah. Thermal energy has two types of energy. Heat. Yeah. Two types of heat. Mm -hmm. Have you learned the physics? Endothermic heat? energy or what kind of heat? Latent heat. Oh. Sensible yeah. heat. Yeah. Latent yeah. heat. Yeah, that. Great. <laughs> thermal energy. Yeah, we've got a lot of thermal energy. Energy is a process in making the dynamics, making clouds. 
But is there anything else you can explain? Yes. Well, the, the ocean it should, it would really can, uh, hold a lot of thermal energy because it's a of its, its natural mm -hmm. chemistry. Yeah. And but so that changes a lot as well. Yeah, exactly. And. Warmer air can hold more moisture. Ah, oh, you got me. Well, I'm a slide going to show you. How about you? <laughs> okay, somebody else? <laughs> I was thinking maybe with all this warmer, um, like, air, would that change wind patterns? Very good thinking. You guys so smart. I can tell you all because my students. They're very good. Yeah, that's how keep your thinking, thinking, and then you read. And then, oh, that makes sense, right? That's how the way we learn stuff. So the, we need to talk about hydrological cycles because, yes? Uh, does the height of the rainfall, like where it originates, how does uh -huh. that have an effect on intensity? So like if it had a higher condensation, uh -huh. level, would that create a higher intensity storm yeah. as well? Because they're falling apart. You have good thinking. You already touched two topics. <laughs> <laughs> the high condensation level, condensation level associated with cumulus clouds. You know, the bottom layer is condensation level. But in general, the lower condensation level, the heavier, the higher intensity the rain. Now, we want to talk about high top clouds. People study the tropical uh, precipitation, they, they look at the how high the top cloud is. You know, satellite, how satellite can measure precipitation? One thing they measure is how high are the clouds. Now, in order to measure how high are the clouds, because satellite is taking radiation, they are not like radar get in and out, different, right? So they look at the temperature. The, the physical laws, very good connecting temperature with everything else, with the radiation energy. So if the cold temperature higher than the cloud top. So yes, if the cloud top booming up, the like Kimber's nimble cloud overshoot to the stratosphere, thunderstorm, severe weather condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good. You would enjoy teaching here. Yes, yeah, <laughs> <good. laughs> I do enjoy teaching yeah. here. So the clouds are the ones that drip, drip, and drip around, and then decide to dump here, right? Where they decide to dump, God knows. <laughs> yeah. So clouds is formed by condensation. People talk about condensation, right? So where the water come from? If you look at the Earth's surface, most water come from ocean. Two thirds ocean, like you mentioned, right? So very large evap evaporation on the land in the forest area. We have evap transpiration, part of this evap transpiration. So the water, if we, we talk about cycle coming here, water come in, and as it rises, the temperature decreases. As it go up to the higher, higher atmosphere, temperature decreases. It gets colder, colder, right? Your hiking go up mountain snow on the top because of the colder temperature. And the colder temperature, the water vapor cannot longer stay there. When the vapor stay there more in the warmer temperature as it gets colder, they drop out. They drop out. Condensation curve making clouds. In the drop out process, they release lots of latent heat. So in the clouds, even with lots and lots of water vapor moisture, they are light because of lots of energy in there. So they, they can move around. And then inside the process, we have two different types of precipitation process, collision collisions or we call it um, um, another thing, crystallization. Yeah, have you learned this process inside the clouds? Oh. Okay, so they have different process depends on temperature of the clouds. And then the droplets inside is bigger, 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 bigger. Now, the droplets in the middle high latitude mostly are solid. They all start with sun because it's so cold up there. Start with snow and then get the melt, right? In the high elevation, it becomes snow, and then melt, it becomes rain. Now, in the tropical cloud, it's different. It's liquid. In hurricane, you don't see snow. If hurricane has snow, wow, that's <laughs> messed up. That's climate, global change. Definitely climate change, right? <laughs> so, uh, so there's a precipitation coming, they move to the land, and some of these lucky and the glaciers take nearly a year to melt. And uh, others are going down by vegetation. Some vegetation immediately evaporate back to the atmosphere, and some of these percolating through. As I was asked for Linda, where you have lost most of the sand in the, in, in the walkway because a lot of water can go down. Maybe we have aquifer underneath. So, in case you, you, you have no water supply one day, the end of the world, they can <laughs> <in the sand. laughs> Okay, to survive. 
So put it down at this water, eventually move very slowly, make a few centimeter a year in back to the ocean. So that become a, a cycle, a full cycle. So start with evaporation, evapotranspiration, and the atmosphere water in there, and then condensed, and the moon, the wind were blowing the air from different places to the different places, and then the cloud, and then we have all this going down again, again, again. Now, uh, the precipitation have different kind of characteristics, and then we have snow and ice with permafrost. What's perm permafrost? So, ground that's been frozen for a long time, never, never yeah. thaws. You, you know, know the soil? Stuff. Yeah, the soil always have water, right? Mm -hmm. The, the water become ice, so they kind of expand the permafrost. In the, in the Arctic region, all the soil are permafrost. They cannot grow vegetation. And uh, in the summertime, some of these are melt, and then the land sink. And in the wintertime, it's up again. You know, it's kind of but anyway, so let's see what's my next here. Questions. What would happen to each component here if air temperature increased, based on theory? So evaporation. Is it going to increase or decrease evaporation if it gets warmer? Mm -hmm. Increase. Mm -hmm. increase. Mm -hmm. No, because you're going to dry so quickly. You, you know, you have dry blower, it's warmer. Warm, dry blower, much faster dry. You know, cold dryer is like very cold. How about atmospheric water vapor content? Increase. Increase, yes. Cloud cover? Increase. Increase. Ocean to the land, vapor transportation? Decrease. Ocean to land and water increase. vapor transportation. Mm -hmm. yeah. If water vapor increase, if wind speed oh, doesn't yeah. change, That's like still increase. Layer yeah. And yeah. 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 Theoretically, we talk about theory. In reality, you may not, you know, it may not happen. But in theory, if we have more water vapor because of warmer air in the same kind of wind speed, we are moving more water vapor, right? So transportation should increase. That's how the atmosphere rivers become more severe. Yes. Uh, uh, what about fog? That's a type of water vapor. Yeah, fog is type of clouds. Okay. Yeah, it, it's like the clouds that nest the, under the ground on the, on the surface. Yeah. How about uh, ocean precipitation? What's going to happen as the climate gets warmer? Increase. 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 The level will rise. I don't know. You know, it's it's, a, it's nothing wrong to say we don't know. We need to study them because in the ocean we didn't have data at all. Now we have remote sensing, sunlight. Now we can study uh, later on, but we still cannot figure out what's happened in the ocean. But it's a less of concern as a land of precipitation. What happened to the land precipitation as kind of get warmer? Oh, okay. depends on where you are. Yeah, whatever answer is correct. <laughs> the wrong price, you're the winner. <laughs> the increase or decrease do not change. More unpredictable. Yeah, so that's why we need a lot of study on that, right? Otherwise, if we know, oh, the climate change problem solved. And the pristine characters, like snow, people say, oh, the climate is warmer, you will have less snow. No, some places have more snow. Yeah, if the cold, because if the rain, cats and dogs, cats and dogs snows, right? Snow get the thick. So it's complicated, it's not easy. And the snow and ice, ice melted in the uh, Arctic ice uh, disappearing is a, is a thing people keep on talk about. Yet permafrost thaw, people, sometimes people say permafrost melt. Do you, hear, do you heard people say permafrost melt? Good, you're a lucky one. Okay. If somebody says that, no, permafrost only thaw. You cannot melt because permafrost a lot of dirt in them. Dirt don't melt away. The scientists always say, like a chicken, you take chicken out from freezer, the chicken is going to melt. <laughs> <laughs> People are laughing at you. Like chicken is going to thaw. <laughs> okay, so you learn something so you can talk. <laughs> vegetation, what's going to happen to vegetation? I don't know. I'm not a vegetation person, but I love vegetation. <laughs> but the one thing I know, if precipitation change, vegetation is going to change also. Now, the relationship about water vapor and, uh, temper uh, and air temperature, we have a theorem called clausius clapeyron relationship. Two different scientists come up with the same idea. So this relationship is in the equation expressed like this. The water vapor in the air, 
respond to air temperature is exponentially with temperature, but there's another temperature. It's kind of get complicated. But if you're good at the math, basically it tells you it's nonlinear relationship. Nonlinear relationship is giving a constant temperature. Let me see, maybe I should show you this thing first. So the water vapor holding capacity, what is holding capacity? If, if you, you read the word, you never know. What are you thinking? Holding capacity. How are you going to explain holding capacity? How, how much something, whatever that something is, yeah. holds a particular, I guess, you, amount of weight of whatever the water is. Or whatever right. Is your so, yes, the maximum amount of water vapor the air can carry. You know, my holding capacity, maybe 100 pounds of rice. Even more, <laughs> more, more, more. I have to drop rice. I would rather starve me. I cannot carry it. The same thing in the water. In the atmosphere, they have limited amount of water they can carry. And the air temperature increase, what happens? Molecules become a lot of energy, become more active. As molecules become more active, they need more space, right? right? In the freeway, you drive fast, you need more space. Otherwise, bam. Kiss each other for nothing, <laughs> and uh, so the water vapor have chance come in. The water vapor can stay in the air. There's so much room between the molecules, right? So the uh, the condition is if relative humidity do not change, <laughs> and uh, based on research on global average, relative humidity do not change. Okay, so if relative humidity stay the same. But if it's 100%, then this is a red line. As air temperature increases from 20 degree to 30 degree, the water vapor holding capacity increases how much? About, if you read this, from 30 to 15. About 30 minus 15 is 15, right? Now, if, if you look here, from 30 degree to 40, 10 degree increase, you will read through here is 50, and this mm -hmm. is about 27. 15 minus 27, how many? Three. Three. three, much bigger, the same amount of temperature increase in the higher end, just increase more proportionally than the lower end. So that's why we call nonlinear relation. It's not linear relation. You give an equal amount of increase, you increase an equal amount of energy, right? Mm -hmm. Or equal amount of water. So that is becomes very important that when we talk about water vapor change, if you want to give a number, you will see the percentage of change. You cannot give volume how many grams of water vapor or specific humidity has been changed. So this is kind of physical geography uh, uh, books you will, you will see that. Now change in precipitation total. People said we don't know. But there's a new rules because if you think about if Warmer temperature with higher atmosphere water vapor transportation. We have heavy clouds, so more precipitation in theory, right? Does that sound so good? A lot of time theory doesn't work with the reality. <laughs> precipitation is a, is a one thing because we really don't know high water transport. What if the area all of a sudden without wind? Wind pattern change, right? And we really don't know more water vapor transport, more more clouds, not necessarily summer, sea breeze coming, so moist in the ocean, but the wind never rain. We have so much water in the air, why is it don't rain? Because it's a least a process. Even if we have more cloud, not necessarily means we're gonna have more rain. Rain is not necessarily can materialize based on how much water uh, along in the clouds or heavier, bigger. If it doesn't rain, it just doesn't rain. And the latent heat is part of energy, right? Energy is played a very important role. And then atmosphere instability. We talk about convective cloud, atmosphere is really unstable. If unstable, we have more dynamic, the more convective precipitation. So all this is gonna change. So in the early days, people look at the precipitation, so they find out, instead of saying, I don't know, or it can be anything, what we found, wet place become wetter, dry place become drier, Wet season becomes wetter and the dry season becomes drier. That sounds bad. Sounds like Trump. Rich people get more money, <laughs> poor people are too bad. <laughs> right? Cut capitalism. Then the atmosphere has a tendency. <coughs> it's easy to do, right? Bad things are easy to do, good things are hard to do. Um, 
So that's become problem. Look at the guy practice this instrument. Yes, it can then <coughs> stop rain. You know, people play this instrument where they are. Yeah, very, very up to north. You know, very cold place. It's cold place never have a, have a very convective or strong rain. Mm -hmm. It rains like a little small. Now he has to use umbrella. Actually, the picture is coming from somebody citing my paper, put a picture there. I like, I steal all the pictures from the <laughs> articles I show you here. <coughs> yes. Oh. Oh, no, no, I was, I was waving in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so changing pristine characters in theory that if precipitation increase, you got to see is because by extreme precipitation. Extreme has all kinds of definition. Somebody will say extreme is the maximum amount of precipitation in the whole year, or some people say top fifty five percent of the precipitation. Or ten percent precipitation extreme is whatever you you decide. Then you cannot say how many millimeter or how many inch because it's relative, right? In California, if we have like one hour five inches of rain, it's everybody's underwater. It's dry. It's like historic. Maybe it's once in hundred years kind of precipitation. But if you go to Florida, it's like eh, we got that every year. Mm -hmm. So it's all relative, right? So. <coughs> In IPCC, what is IPCC? The International Panel on Climate Change. Very good. International Panel on Climate Change. Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> right? They have so many scientists from all around <laughs> the world together. You know how much money they get? Split all the uh, uh, ten, uh, how, how many? I think $20,000 uh, winning. They spread out. Everybody get how much? <laughs> Scientists told me thirty-five bucks, <laughs> <laughs> but they have certificate. They didn't pay enough because it's a non-profit, uh, non-affiliated with any politicals, politicians, or all scientists coming from the world, from, from researchers. They come together and they write this uh, book, book three parts of the books, the theory, and the and, and the future projection, and then the impact, impact to all kinds of different things. And they have different copy every five years. They, they publish one in the early year, 2007. Said so global climate, owing to increased water vapor, which you already know. When you read something you know, how do you feel? Smart, feel nice, <laughs> that's why you learn. Yeah, if you read something, God, I'm so stupid. No, nothing, right? That's why you learn. You, le you learn, you read down, make you feel, uh, feel better lead to more intense precipitation events, yeah. even when the total annual precipitation is reduced. They find out the place even precipitation has been reduced. They become much stronger precipitation, more intense, but less frequent. And with prospects for even stronger events, if the amount of precipitation increase, the place, the wet places, they're going to have lots of violent precipitation events. That's in 2007 and the two, 2015. There's not much to add because they already discovered these is extreme precipitation events will become more intense and frequent in many regions, even in the places ready to dry. So I like IPCC. I, I study the reading IPCC. Why? Because all the good citations are there. <laughs> if you want to read stuff, if you have limited amount of time to understand, you go for the best sources, right? You don't look at the fake fake news online, <laughs> stuff like that, right? You waste your time. Find out, oh, I've been cheated. I'm so angry. Go to the good sources. <coughs> so my study mostly you uh, in the northern Eurasia. Yeah, why I study northern Eurasia? People always ask me. Uh, when I was a graduate student, just happened with my PhD advisor, Larry Kalkstein, had an EPA grant, and they said, oh, I have this seven stations smuggled out from Russia. You need to tell me what's going to happen in the climate using the seven stations. In early days, uh, the climate change, it, it's, it's a new signal, right? So the most places we would like to find the biggest signal are in the high latitudes. Why is that? 
we call, always call amplified warming in high latitude. We don't see much of California warming temperature because we are so warm already. But in high latitude, why is the temperature increase sometimes double the average? So low? A small increase there is a big deal? Yeah, because they are so little, temperature, very good point. But I didn't think about that. But I, I will <laughs> if I have learned something new. But think about something else that I'll talk about. Or you can think about. Why in the high latitude we have amplified global warming compared to others? It, it's higher than the clouds, perhaps? Can you is, I've been wanting to think about barometric pressure, any kind of pressure at high latitude. Do you have a lower barometric pressures at the high latitude? In high latitude, actually, the higher pressure. The air is heavy. Yeah. Hair is drier. Hair is cold. Cold hair, they don't bundle together. So it's cold. They crowd together. Warm air, they fluffy out, so they are lighter. Yeah. But it's feedback. Have you heard of feedback no. process? <coughs> oh, feedback is like I'm here make you uh, punch on you. You're a nice person, okay? If you're an angry person, punch me even more. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm getting a punch in more. That's how do you feedback? How to control? <laughs> right? That's the high latitude. Feedback, yeah, yeah. right? So in the high latitude regions, if we do a little warming, we melt the snow. And the one the melting the snow, snow has a very high albedo. Have you heard about albedo? The reflectivity, right? So the sun can get more, a lot more. All of a sudden, you know, dirt show up, they soak up a lot of more energy. Continue warm, continue to melt snow, just go on and on and on. It's a very unstable atmosphere. And chew it a little bit, you know, the, the chain effect, amplified. So we're looking for amplified climate signal in high latitudes. So I took that job, I did a paper with it. The results are uh, not very uh, uh, inconclusive because the data end up in 1989. One talk about global warming is later 80s and the 90s, right? So it's too early. But uh, anyway, and then after I graduate, I have opportunity to get more data. Back to then, you know, one of the Soviet Union crops, all the scientists from Soviet Union come to the United States. And, then, and then we, we welcome them because they bring the good data. Thousand <laughs> places. They are studying 1930s, study 1930s, and have all this good observation. If we go to Canada, studying 1950, right? If we get to Alaska, even later, we don't have data. So these are the treasure data. They come broaden data, and uh, they are like, oh, great, work with us. And then later, I later heard government pay lots of money, but they want money into their own account instead of go back and back to the Russia. Bye bye, I'm gone. <laughs> but anyway, I heard all the, the, this story. But anyway, we benefit and I benefit. So we have all this data. So all my research concentrates in the high latitudes because I like to see amplified effect. I like to fight, right? So uh, I give an example all in, in the northern Eurasia. Now, what you're looking at is relationship, correlation coefficients. Everybody learned, right? Correlation laws, that's very simple. Between the temperature and the uh, precipitation total. That's the precipitation total. Now, if you look at the red, mean positive correlation. If you have higher temperature for that season, we're going to have more precipitation. If the blue is negative, if you have high precipitation, uh, higher temperature, less precipitation. And then you see the, you use the open circles means not statistically significant, mm -hmm. so we can ignore them. This place is, has no significant relationship, but we. For this, we do see a lot of red in the winter time. In the winter season, with a, a season with a air temperatures higher winter, we will see a lot of more precipitation. That kind of feed of theory increase the holding capacity, increase precipitation, increase clouds. That's a happy place to talk about. Now, if I look at summer, completely opposite. If we have a warmer temperature in the summer, we have less precipitation. Now, if we uh, look at the spring, only in the northern part where temperature is cold, that temperature and the precipitation total positive, the rest of this more like a negative or not significant, the same thing in the fall. So it's a very, very clear geographical pattern. That's why study geography is so important because things are different, depends on the location. <coughs> so, 
my conclusion for that particular research was increased precipitation in the winter, but decrease in summer if air temperature increase. So summer is a relatively dry season in Russia. In the winter, have you been in the winter in Siberia? <laughs> <laughs> People always ask me, you study Siberia? I say, yeah, I start from remote. I look at the data, I'm not going there. <laughs> it's, it's cold. It's, it's just a, a, a cloudy day <coughs> all the time. The way I can fly, like a very <laughs> puppet, you know? It's a very, very strong way. So. And, and uh, then let's look at the frequency, precipitation frequency. Results are very similar to total. In the winter, temperature increase, we have lots and lots of more precipitation days, more wet days, miserable. They don't like a warm climate. We would assume like, oh, you know, uh, yeah, global warming is bad. You know, islands underwater and uh, we have desert. But Russian may be happy about it. No, they are not happy. They, they, if in the winter there are lots of wet days, and in the in the, in the summer they have less wet days. If you talk to Russian people, they are used to the cold climate. Summertime is short but very uncomfortable to them because they don't know how to deal with the sun. They don't know how to deal with warm climate. Yet for the spring in the south, decrease frequency. In the spring, less precipitation day, and in the fall, less precipitation day. So this is the kind of study I did in the early days, try to, try to understand if a climate gets warmer, how the precipitation total and frequency, frequency is gonna change by looking at the correlation between the temperature and uh, uh, precipitation. Ask any questions? Okay. If you, you feel like you need to, to clear, uh, to clarify some stuff. So more wet days in winter, but less Wednesday, wet days in summer. That's a conclusion based on the simple analysis, even simple analysis with a lot of our station there. So signal is overwhelming. Very, very few places can find such a unified signal. You know, people, I remember I first do the Russian station, Dr. Mather, Delaware, they said, you know, why are you studying Russia? You know, the weather station was forced labor by criminals. <laughs> they do observations, they don't care. They make mistakes, so if data is not good, how the results will be good? Have a good point, but if all criminals make up the data the same way, <laughs> they have cell phone. Hey, let's make precipitation more today. Less tomorrow. There's no way. If uh, everybody make, make make mistake, the noise will filter out. The truth will come out. So that's why we need to look at a lot and lots of data. And the many many years, criminal maybe ten years. Next criminal comes. <laughs> they don't you know, they, criminal are not consistent at all. Not criminal. Criminal what? So all filtered out, the so signal stand out for the research. So I still be able to use the, the data to do research. <coughs> now, increasing precipitation intensity is become harder and hard issue. Why? Because that's important. The fresh water has been thrown away, like the dam leaking, right? We have all something, lots of precipitation coming in short time. We cannot keep all those, we have to let them go. And the area we have flood and all this all wasted, causing damage. And then, because the, you know the total does not change much in the global average, so we can have drought. Between the big events, there's nothing, right? Also, <coughs> you have so much stuff, the next thing, you have nothing. You have the, the vegetations are not adapt to that. The vegetations have the, uh, some trees are, some trees are not. They have to go the root very, very deep, right? To wait for the next, next rain season come. So it's not good. Now, this graph from one of my paper looking at intensity increase. Intensity increase, let me see if I have a title here. Yeah, so this is a explanation, explain for this graph. The rate of change in percentage in precipitation intensity for each degree of air temperature increase based on partial regression coefficient calculated on decade of time series and the availability associated AO removed. Yeah, forget about all these complicated things. I did a lot of stuff in the paper trying to show people, you know, the temperature 
relationship is not being confused <coughs> with because of the Arctic Oscillation. I wonder, anyone have any heard about the Arctic Oscillation? Okay, how, how many of you heard about El Nino? Yeah, El Nino is, is like Arctic Oscillation in the Arctic. El Nino is a big event, really kind of uh, causing a very dramatic change in the station in, the, in our area. El Nino is wet, you know, stuff like that. Arctic Oscillation is a type of atmosphere patterns. They, they <coughs> go around in the cycles and causing a lot of change in precipitation temperature. So I need to remove that impact. I want to look at the temperature because global warming is not about Arctic Circle, right? It's about uh, temperature. So, and you can see that this alleged green, yellowish are those with positive and the blue and the purplish are the negative values. As you can see, lots of, lots of red, red the big ones, red the green. Spring is more dramatic. Winter is, is the least significant. Winter is not changing much because it's just so cold. It's even very cold, we talk about very cold temperature, even we increase 10 degrees, and the water will be increased still very little, right? Summer, a big change, but of course some areas they don't show, they show, show the decrease. So as I see, intensity is very tricky. It's not like everywhere you're gonna see the same thing. <coughs> and the percentage change, the range is such big, 5% to 60%, you know, 50%. Consider the intensity 50%, which means uh, if, if normally uh, two millimeter a day, all of a sudden they become three millimeter a day. That's a huge difference, right? So in, on, on average, precipitation increase about 6.2% for the spring and three about 3% 3 for other seasons. Now this number 6.2% kind of close to 7% about the water vapor increase. On global scale, people said increase water vapor uh, with temperature about 7%. We just talk about Colossus, Clapton equation, right? But precipitation global scale only increased about 3%, less than half of that. Because not all the increased water vapor is gonna dump water on the land, right? <coughs> now intensity increase bigger than precipitation. If we average just look at the Siberia area, even this area relative small amount of precipitation. Even they think it's heavy rain compared to California, it's not heavy at all. <coughs> yeah, it's dry, one is dry, it just cannot produce a lot of precipitation. <coughs> now, look at this graph. Hmm. This graph shows what I did was, I take the precipitation for each station, separate them into percentile, top 10, we call 90 percentile means 10 percent of all those days they have in the top highest amount of daily precipitation intensity, and they separate 90 to 80, 80 to 70, and then look at how they change. Because if people said more become more extreme or high intensity, you will see the high percentile precipitation increase more significant, right? The lower ones should be decreased, and then I look at all the characteristic intensity in the black. And blue is total, green is the precipitation fraction to the total, and the wet days, and the wet day fraction. Now the fraction is that 10% that, uh, of precipitation contribute to how much total, right? Because it's a high intensity, like 10% on the top, they probably contribute more, more than 70% of the precipitation in the area. Some place may contribute to 50, but lower 10% maybe only contribute 1% of the total. So fraction also tells a different story. So if I just look at this graph, what stand out to you? If you produce this graph by all the hard work and the coding calculation, bam, result. Then you have to learn to interpret results. So if this graph, will you be happy or you'll be not happy? What stand out? Intensity. Which line? Intensity. Intensity. The, 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 black. Yeah, the black one. Always this is significant. And at a 95% significant across, even in the lower intensity ones, they actually increase more. 
then high intensity for the Siberia area. We look at the rest of this has going down. So if we separate them, will be higher than 80 percent, 70 percent all positive, and then lower than all negative. Which means if we look precipitation total, more and more precipitation occur in the high intensity category, in the high up 70 percent category. Less less occur in the very very low intensity. The same way as number of the day, the frequency, the, the same way as fraction, all those. So when I see this graph, I jump up and down. <laughs> that that's how discover come in. You can only visualize it. Otherwise, with so much data, if you look at oh this positive, oh this negative, your eye go cross. You drive <laughs> yourself crazy. So you, the way data, data visualization, you take a lot of information, put out, and then you can see it clearly. So that's the conclusion of this uh, graph, the final graph for that paper. Increased atmospheric water vapor is directly related linearly. Ha, huh. temperature to the water vapor is not linearly, but water vapor is related to the higher higher daily precipitation intensity, regardless how precipitation change. Poor people, rich people, they all become aggressive, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> precipitation become much, much high intensity, even they have very little water. They still like to go to gamble or put all the water at once instead of spread out. Somehow go crazy, right, with temperature. And it accompanied by increased precipitation total on the wet day from heavy events and the decrease from light ones. So my conclusion, your bottom line, you talk about graph, you talk about your results, what is a message? If you have to give one <coughs> sentence message for your paper is atmospheric water vapor is the key to understand precipitation extremes and intensity and the warming climate. That's the contribution of my article here in the geophysical research letter. And this graph kind of tells a story, very simple story, but takes a lot, a lot of work. I worked, I worked, I coded, I coded, and finally draw this graph. And uh, I celebrate with a cup of wine. <laughs> 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 yeah. Then I can rest for the rest of the evening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, scientists are crazy. You know, scientists are crazy. A life world is hard. I really want to see what's happening. Sometimes can be disappointing. <sighs> Sometimes can be very happy, you know. So you see the professor very happy. He got a good discovery happen. <laughs> Super grumpy, don't touch him. He has hit the head on the wall. Something's not quite so yet. Okay. So my recent two papers about try to answer two questions. <coughs> dig deep and deeper. Sometimes you, you, you dig so deep, you don't know what's going on. But these two questions. Has precipitation shift towards more convective types? If so, would the shift explain the increased tense in the extremes? So that's kind of come up to me by accident. I don't know why. I'm watering in the garden, in my backyard, all of a sudden. I said, what's my next project? I find <laughs> out the water vapor is so important. And because of water vapor, it seems more and more rain in the heavy ones and less and less in the lighter one. What I can do next? And then I realized, I, I teach class, talk about clouds. Yeah, convective ones are the violent ones. Non-convective or non-violent, maybe we should look at that. That's how, you know, it's like Newton's apple hit his head. <laughs> Gravity is not quite that big. But something like that, you have to keep on thinking. Keep on. The science study is all about thinking and thinking and thinking, try to find explanations, and then you're going to learn. That's how you go. So we're going to talk about this. Lightning hit my head. <laughs> it's here. Thunder is coming. <laughs> so the start with the data. Because what you can do is limited by what kind of data you have. Like, thanks for the Russian scientist and the agreement we have data. Now, I have to use two different data sets. In early studies, I can only use one to take care of this. One we call it Global Synoptic Climatology Network. What is synoptic means? Same time, same way. Good. Yes. Network means everybody observe. Get up 8 o'clock, hey, ding dong, go to measure, <laughs> and then go take a nap. 
Ding dong, go on the measure. This is how they do in the early days, right? So they have these three hours of observation. Every three hours, they have to come out. No, no matter if it's a criminal or pay the government <laughs> employees, doesn't matter. They have to do the work. And uh, they have what the description in their coding. It's showery presentation. It's a presentation accompanied by thunderstorm. And they also have many the data. They have all the instruments in the box in there. They have 747 station. Wow. It's a lot, a lot of station. Talk about, you know, old royal family empire. They have so much power, they can force people to get that. Um, the data is coming from 2005, uh, published 2005. So actual data end up 2000. So we cannot go beyond the later decades. Yes. The other day I saw there was a notice that they set up a new satellite. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the lightning strikes across the, the, the globe. Uh, the globe yeah. Uh, that is specific for that. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's too early to be connected into that. That looks like it might Possibly. Be. You know, with all the climate data in the United States, all free. You can get for NCDC, but not lightning. You know why? Mm -hmm. Why lightning data you cannot get it except you have to buy, spend lots of money to buy? Mm -hmm. Disney World. Golf course, all this money making recreational area, lightning is very, very important to them. They need to know when lightning comes, the golf people get off the off the field, we stop the, 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 the things, a lot of money. So they commercialize it. Oh. They took all the data, they buy the equipment, maybe satellite is sponsored, so they can save life because of the lawsuit. Oh. Yeah, if so, so the they don't trust the government. Have data, you know. They want my own data. Monitor where I'm gonna shut down the machine. When, so we don't have a lawsuit. Mm. So when we talk, so that's the that's where we're at with that particular satellite. Then must so, be. I didn't so know. I learned from you. I'm gonna look up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, um, yeah, just went up the other day, and I wasn't sure why, but or who was the sponsor. I'm not sure if it was a NASA thing or whatever. But I heard you say yeah. the harvesting lightning in the oceans. Is there so many lightning strikes on the ocean? That oh. You know, putting the harvest energy Wow. Too, I really like to hear your stories. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of interesting going on. Yeah, so lighting is very difficult to do research now because they commercialize, they, 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 they want their own. And uh, the pre then we have prestation, a daily prestation temperature. It's a different data set. They have 518 stations, probably different organization, and uh, they archived in the carbon dioxide information center. There's another center in the United States in the, I think somewhere in the North Carolina somewhere, or Virginia, do the climate change early days. So I got that data from them. The data, the latest is 2012. So we have data until 2010, so which is good. However, if we combine them, I searching through, I wrote the program to matching, the matching, try to find, you know, that station close to the other stage together, so I can use the data to separate the presentation out. I only got 152. Yeah, so out of this uh, 100, 100 station, only 152, they're very close to each other. So basically the same way that happened when they measure the presentation. A lot of work on that, but as I said, you have learned the coding. If you try to look by your glasses sitting there, you'll be driving nuts. Very bad mood for the whole month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Coding, haha, -ha, they identify, bingo. So this, I, I, in my graph, I, you know, the, the, the place with no, with nothing there means there's no station there. If there's no station, we cannot put stuff there. We cannot make up data. Other, otherwise, like fake information. <laughs> yeah, that's very bad. So climatology, the mean wet day associated with convective and non-convective. So this is a non-convective, and this is convective. Oh, I have this pointer. Now, we want to stand out to you. Just compare the convective, non-convective. What's the difference in general Wind. to your eyes? It's more blue than the red. More blue in the red. Blue means less days. days. Red means more days. Now, in general, look, look up. If you're artist, look at the picture. It's an extra painting. So what's different on this set with other set? Non-convective seems to be increasing. We're hearing more non-convective days. No, this is a climatology volume. We haven't talked about the trend yet. 
Uh, this is a climatology mm -hmm. why means, for example, yeah, I need to explain this a little bit because everything is so new to you, but you do a very good job. The, these are the, uh, I think, 35 years average, so which means for the four non convert precipitation occurs about 50 some days in that location. For this location, for non convert precipitation, it only occurs about 10 days. That's climatology. Right. In here, in summer, convective precipitation can occur more than 60 days. 60 days, you have showers, you have thunderstorms. So in general, those and that, what you see, which one is more erratic, more changes geographically? Convective. Convective is more at a smaller scale, right? Unpredictable. So you see convectives, you have so many centers. Bam, 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 bam. They're not connected. Bam, 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 bam. All the little centers. That's convective. Now, if we look at it, they kind of slow in a way, right? They kind of connected in a way because non convective ones, the structures from clouds cover a large area. They rain, you know, they have systematic ways for the shower. I'm dry here and they're raining right over there. Like tornadoes coming around. Lift my neighbor's house. Your house is completely nothing happened. But across the street, the house is gone because because of very, very small scales to look at. And then you look at the winter. The winter all red in the non convective The winter, there's not much energy, right? Not much energy. You don't have convective uh, stuff. So all these clouds hang there, little bit of snow. Actually, no snow, like sleet or so ice, ice. It's not like in a you know, sand across, <laughs> white snow, completely fake. It's not real. If you go to Ar Arctic, the snow is dark color because they burn wood, so much haze, so much there. It's not pretty at all, I tell you. Sometimes you will not feel it's snowing or not because such a small, it's not a big snowflake. The big snowflake we only see is in the mountain area in tropical zones. We have lots of water by the ocean. Mm -hmm. You see a big snowflake fluffy. But in the cold, in, in the Arctic, Antarctic, especially in Antarctic, in the summertime, scientists went there, they are, they are raining or snowing, whatever it is. They really cannot feel until they come back and then they are, you know, bright jacket, have powder, like, like you know, you make a pizza dough and the, mm -hmm. the flour around, that's the smooth snow you get. It's not like magic snow, so beautiful, yeah. <coughs> so, but uh, in the winter time, uh, let's say convective, first, mostly was non-convective, convective is very small, but in the coastal areas, a lot of convective, there's always have water, water here, and uh, the center, there's some convective, but in general, they're blue. Blue means less than five days, right? So this kind of graph I'm very proud of because nobody have done this. <laughs> Somebody write a paper, write a book, they will ask my graph. <laughs> my early days, I talk about presentation, actually, Ceres is a famous mm -hmm. scientist and wrote this book about the Arctic climate. They asked me to contribute the graph with my name there. So this, somebody <coughs> write a book, they, uh, they will ask me for this. Now, we have to take all this data to display in a way simple people can visualize. So what I did here, quite called a time series, or convective fraction. Convective fraction means how much total precipitation for as convective divided by total precipitation. So as you can see, everything is going upward. I just put the linear trend, all significant. Winter, fall, fall you have colorful leaves, spring is green, and uh, summer is hot, red, and the winter is black. They are all increasing at similar rate, 0 0.62, 0 0.76, 0 0.74, 0 0.71. Very consistent, the, the convective precision increase percentage-wise, but that was amazing. 
I double, triple check my data because I said, it cannot be so, so clean. But I look at all the stations. I'm gonna tell you the truth why I sent for, for publication that the two scientists asked me to plot all 152 stations for him. He wants to check every single station, make sure the results are good. And I did that. So my response to my reviewers, 10 pages with, <laughs> with like eight graphs. My paper, only five pages with six <laughs> graphs. <laughs> A lot of behind the work. But I don't want to put all the graphs to boil to death. Okay. You know, 120. So that's how the science works. Uh, credible work have to put in there. <coughs> so when I see the result, then my second question is, hey, are those related to temperature and related to water vapor? Because I really, really like the water vapor. The, I'm the only very few people using water vapor data to look the relationship. So let's see. So we have to do simple correlation with temperature and with water vapor to see what's happening. No, I want to do it different visualization. That's, if you have taken status class, that's like the, what's called? What is a graph, type of graph called? Histogram. Yeah, histogram. Histogram still very handy because then I can put the 700 stations in one graph. 700 stations here, 700 stations here for different seasons. It's so Interesting. So what I did, look at the departure. So I take each one station, each station I take here. I separate the days, convective precipitation, days, non-convective precipitation, and then in these days, what's the temperature departure from the climatology value for convective? What is temperature departure from climatology value from non-convective precipitation? And I do again departure from for humidity. Convective, non-convective, and they put it all over here. <coughs> and uh, data, because I have so many stations, so data is kind of a like normal distributed bell shape, kind of, right? So what you want to see is, maybe I should show you here. For example, winter time. The peak, the blue one is the convective precipitation. The peak of the convective precipitation occurs about Temperature have the five degree above normal. Mm -hmm. So on average, for each for all these stations, right? If temperature is five degree above normal, most likely it's convective precipitation. So now we look at non-convective. It's about zero point kind of one something. Mm -hmm. Non-convective, but they all above average. So in the winter time, as we learned earlier, warmer temperature, more precipitation, right? So precipitation day happened all the warmer days. In California, it was funny, where I, I teach class, ask students, you know, when it rains, do you think it's colder or warmer? Mm -hmm. Ask you the same question, when it rains, it's colder or warmer? It's colder mm -hmm. in here, rain is colder, but if in, in the other part of the country, the rain is warmer, it's lots of latent heat. So people will say, too cold to rain, too cold to snow. Too cold to snow, snow is so cold. <laughs> yeah, too cold, so there isn't any water vapor in the air. Don't expect snow. That's why in a polar region, in the Antarctic, the snow's like a little, little flowers. You left over from your pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so, Temperature difference is 0 uh, 4.4. So we do the same thing for the spring, even bigger, 5.5. For summer, only 2.4. Now, the summer thing is funny. The precipitation can occur at the lower temperature. Yeah, a lower temperature, if we put a zero line here, the most rain can roll because we learned earlier, graph, warmer temperature, less precipitation days. So all rain day in summer is colder. Cooler in summer. So they, that makes sense. Everything pieced together, right? 4.8. Now, the other side is about specific humidity. How's my time doing? How long I have? Oh, well, we can go wrapping it I, up. I can yeah, we're, we're, we're <laughs> going, going a little bit long. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, all you need to do is just one line. <laughs> <laughs>
almost all the convective occurs wetter than normal. But non-convective can occur wetter or drier. You see, as it gets warmer, it becomes more violent because more convective is happening. Ha ha, I jump up and down for another cup of wine <laughs> and good <laughs> results. So convective precipitation occurs at above normal specific humidity and high temperature days. So that's the conclusion from this particular study. Uh, I think this is published in the climate dynamics. So the answer for the question one is increased air temperature and atmosphere water vapor leads to significant increase in convective precipitation at expenses non-convective one because we have less frequency. So the non-convective kind of disappear, but endangered species maybe in the future. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. <laughs> now the most re recent paper is about second question. Would they explain intensity and extreme change? So we're going to uh, examine this. We look at the total, look at the frequency, look at the intensity, and look at stream for convective and the non-convective. We look at them all, not just look at the frequency. The previous paper is just look at the frequency. Now I have to look at all of them. Now we only have 152 stations, right? And then this <coughs> positive correlation means red. Red is positive, as you can see. Convective, mostly red. Non-convective, mostly blue. Mixed, mixed means that they had both convective and non-convective event. It's kind of messy, right? So focus on the top ones. And this has been tweeted <coughs> after part. Somebody tweeted my graph. I said, hmm, because I spent four or five hours just putting this down in the right place <laughs> using IDL. <laughs> and then the math lab will say, please, they will do right away. My student can do that, but I can't. Too old to learn the new language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the dominant pattern of increased convective and decreased convective is total. So total shows yes. Bingo. And then I have intensity and using time series, I average all together because signal is so overwhelming. So I just average all together to show red ones all goes up. Black, red ones convective, violent. Black ones non-convective, blue ones mixed, as you can see. For the total on the top <coughs> and the in daily intensity, focus on this one. Intensity, the red ones increasing and uh, non-convective intensity decrease and mixed also decrease on average. <coughs> <coughs> Here is another graph, <coughs> look at the different season. The previous one, look at the annual. Now we look at the season. Now, let's see. I need to ask you a question, even I don't have time. I want to challenge you, okay. So if you get these results, like one of my students, plant all this, you look at this graph. What stick out to you? What looks funny here? Which line, if you want to remove, which color line you're going to remove it? They won't tell you a good story. Which one? Which one, they don't show significant increase or decrease. The climate change, also look at the trend, right? Which one doesn't, doesn't look at the trend at all? Green. The green one. The green one is a total precipitation without separate them. So in Siberia, if you don't separate them, you don't see extremes. You don't see daily extreme. Daily extreme, for each season, one day they have maximum precipitation. So I didn't plot that. I plot all these exciting results, and red ones, <laughs> convert it all, go all the way up. Look, go all the way up. Now convert it all goes up. I'm so happy. And the reviewer said, I want to see total. What's happening to total? Mm -hmm. Even if they're boring, they don't see anything, I put in there. And then he now, mm, that <coughs> will increase your significance of your results. Because if you, if you don't do this work separately, then we don't see any signals. Only you put in there, you see the signals. So that's a, that's a key. So what happened to red line? I already tell you, they're all increasing. 
what happened to that black line, the whole decrease, that's how you analyze a graph, right? In your visualization, you tell people, the one to green line, nothing, so I even don't. <laughs> so, the, the different relationship between red and the black line, they are opposite. But not only opposite, you see that if you look at the winter black line, high into extreme always happen to non-convective ones. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones seems gentle, larger scale, but those are, are the connect to the maximum accumulation during the day. Mm -hmm. But as towards the end of 2000, they're catching up. The red one convective are getting higher and higher eventually. <laughs> In the summer, of course, convective ones dominant with so much energy and even gets big bigger. Non-convective gets little little. So they kind of the winters they kind of merge together. In summer they fall apart. Look at the spring and uh, fall. I'm sorry. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> they go cross. They go cross each other. At one point in late 1980s, late 1980s, ha, convective precipitation takes <coughs> over. All the extreme happen in the convective. <coughs> Used to be all the extreme happen to non convective now all happen to convective. Finally, finally, women break into the grass ceiling. Convective, <laughs> <laughs> bam! Take over, become violent. <laughs> Participation. I'm just joking. <laughs> so, what does graph tell us? Here's the conclusion. The early precipitation associated with convective has been increasing. The extremes associated with non-convective has been decreasing. And the winter, highest daily intensity occur in non-convective. However, convective are gradually, gradually catch up, approaching. In the spring and the fall, large daily extremes shift from non-convective to convective in the late 1980s, mm -hmm. where this global warming kind of booming mm -hmm. up. Yeah. And the result, another thing is that this green line there, you know, things like boring, doing nothing, ah, without discrimination, prestige type. There's no change in data extremes. Mm. Yeah. How it relates to temperature around the time, but it, this just add time series of convective, non-convective, not convective, extreme, daily extremes, and uh, daily total, and uh, water vapor. Yeah, up and down, up and down, quite, quite synchronized. And if you look at another way, scat plot, they are all statistically significant. So water vapor is important. So we can skip this one. So the answer for question two, yeah, we have more frequent convective precipitation is responsible for daily precipitation extremes. At the atmosphere, water vapor appear to be directly Relate to increased convective precipitation total and daily extremes and the warming climate. So this is my very proud of paper coming out of the day. They email me. I go to the website, click, take a photo on there because there we go. <laughs> Only stay there one day, but that day somebody new come up. <laughs> <laughs> I stay here to enjoy it with you. They said, rep, <laughs> what has changed? My articles, they put in their own words. Rep increase in convective precipitation. Records show. Um, Spike of Eurasia in recent decades. That's their their language. And then I have all these news uh, articles. Take this, and if you can read the Germany, if you can read the Swedish, <laughs> <laughs> what I say about my article. But anyway, <laughs> any questions? Uh, those are the pictures they find to, to put the article. Talk about <laughs> my my stuff. So I, I come here to show you. Any questions about my talk? You're very welcome. It's a lot to digest. Did you get a chance to look at the geography and convection? I'm just curious if it was different at higher latitudes than lower latitudes. I haven't had a chance to look at the lower latitudes. I tried to have students to do it. <coughs> Couldn't find a good data set. Satellite data doesn't separate them well. Okay. And uh, I tried to find the United States, actually students spent a couple of weeks trying to find the data in the United States to look at in lower latitude what's going to happen. They couldn't find the, the, the data. <sighs> the Soviets, powerful, they got their data. <laughs> we still don't have that data to show. But it's a very good question. I really want to know. 
I really want to know what's happening. But at some point, it will saturate. Uh, the, the convective will, will flat off in, in the summertime because they, they got to be in one reach 80%. You cannot continue to increase. They will have threshold to level off. I saw that in the summer in some of the southern station in, in, the, in the Siberia. Okay. It will flat out. It's, it's not like become distinct. Uh, distinct. The, uh, the, the stratophone presentation still be there, but not, uh, not very common, but they cannot be completely gone. Cannot be that way. 